on the doorstep of one of Europe's wealthiest capitals sits the continent's largest slum. Infamous for police raids, Cañada Real has been branded as the drug supermarket of Madrid, a reputation that tars the whole community. Juzgarra, vuelvo a repetir, pero juzgarra todo un barrio por las actividades ilícitas que hagan unos pocos, lo mínimo que es, es, es injusto. Residents have been pulled into a 15-year-long battle with the government, leaving them feeling neglected and abandoned by those who run their city. Electricity supply has been weaponized. A power cut in the area that's lasted over 500 days sees children do their homework by candlelight. The elderly and chronically sick are denied life-saving treatment. The most basic necessities of modern civilization are cruelly absent. Community leaders say the government and the power company conspire to use power cuts to make life so unbearable that people are forced to leave their homes. Evidence of properties demolished by the state is scattered across the whole of the 14-kilometer settlement. Rebuilding has become a crime. Si tu objetivo es que la gente se vaya, pues, pues claro, pues intentas poner todas las excusas posibles. All involved know a solution must be found to Cañada Real, and for many years, politicians of every shade in Madrid have tried to find the answer. So far, all have failed. I travelled to Madrid to try and understand how a situation branded by the UN as a human rights catastrophe could be happening in one of Europe's greatest cities. Reconocimiento ciudadano. Queremos luz ya, queremos contratos, queremos que se nos reconozca como ciudadanos y ciudadanas de esta ciudad. Queremos luz y la queremos pagar. La This queremos is Hudra pagar. Criques, a community leader, activist, and resident of Cañada Real. She stands here in Sol, the center of Madrid, just 15 minutes from her home, protesting for electricity to be switched back on in her neighborhood. Since October 2020, she and 4,000 other Cañada residents have lived with little to no power after the supply was allegedly cut. Split into six sectors, Cañada Real is a 14-kilometer-long linear settlement that's home to over 8,000 people and wraps around the southern edge of the Spanish capital. So essentially what we're driving on right now used to be an old cattle track, so it's what farmers would use to move their herds of animals from one side of Madrid to the other. And then in the late 1950s, early 1960s, people actually began settling on this land. They would find a plot of land and they would start building on it. Now, over six decades later, Cañada Real is home to over 8,000 people and is largely in its own right, its own barrio, its own neighborhood of Madrid. Sector 6, the area where Huda lives with a family, is the newest and largest, home to nearly 3,000 people, a third of whom are children. It's also the area most stigmatized. Residents told me that life in the area was peaceful until 2007 when a neighboring settlement was dismantled and groups of drug dealers moved into their sector. Since then, life has been a battle with the government of Madrid. Homes demolished, electricity supply allegedly cut, and families forced from their homes and relocated up to 100 kilometers away. We'd arranged to travel to Sector 6 and meet with Huda. She'd agreed to drive us through her neighborhood to show me what life's like in her community. Hablas English? You speak English? Almania, how how are you? Without even leaving her street, it was clear as to how tight knit her community is. But I was told that journalists typically come to Huda's neighborhood and request to see nothing but the drugs. Turning right here would take you to the epicenter of that problem, so we instead turned left to see the problems that regular Kenyatta residents face. It wasn't long until we got a small insight into how the authorities treat her community. Hola. Pues. Estigmatizar un poco más, sí. eh, son muy violentos con las personas que vivimos aquí en Canadá Real, sí. sobre todo con los chavales, con los chicos sí. jóvenes. Sí. 
eh, como acabas de ver, como ven que eres una mujer, que vas, bueno, más o menos vestida igual que ellos, pues ya te dicen, no, nada, nada, tú sigue. Sí. She explained that younger men, or veiled women, are typically the victims of police brutality here, saying that the police would usually search the person and their car for little to no reason. She told me a story of a man who was hit by police after being stopped for simply running through his neighborhood, a situation where she felt she had to intervene. In 2017, a pact was signed by regional government that seemingly provided a solution to Kenyatta Real. It was decided that Sector 6 would be dismantled and those living there would be relocated. The rest of the five sectors would be integrated into their surrounding neighborhoods. During that time, however, the government promised to provide basic necessities, such as a water supply and electricity, a promise evidently forgotten. Approaching the end of Sector 6, we came across a van delivering freshly washed clothing, a service carried out by a Christian non-profit organization commissioned by the community of Madrid, used here because of the lack of water and power. <laughs> it seemed absurd to provide a laundry service to residents when guaranteeing them electricity and water, as previously promised, would solve the problem. Este es el camino sin asfaltar. Aquí eh, es donde el pacto regional recoge que esta gente va a ser eh, realojada eh, y va a ser desmantelado sí. este, este sector. Desde el 2017 que se ha firmado sí. el pacto regional, estos eran los primeros que van a ser realojados. Hasta ahora siguen aquí. As we reached the end of sector 6, we saw an area almost completely demolished by the government. Rubble from homes previously knocked down left in place. A tactic, I was told, to prevent others from building there. El Pacto Regional recoge que el camino sin asfaltar, que vivían aquí 150 familias, iban a ser los primeros realojados por la situación de vida que tienen. Primero sí. que es un camino sin asfaltar, luego hay mucho, hay mucho escombro y mucho barro, y la mayoría de las viviendas son chabolas. Entonces, vivían en una situación precaria, Hudra explained that this building is home to a small family with four children, the youngest just months old. The neighbors on either side have already been relocated, one family reportedly 80 kilometers away. Those living in this home are currently stuck in a sort of limbo, awaiting rehousing, but they're told it's a process that takes time, one that doesn't seem to have a deadline. They don't know when they'll be rehomed and this house demolished. I currently stood sort of towards the end of Sector 6 and the fact that there are people living in, in these circumstances sort of 15 kilometers away from the city center of Madrid is, is, is quite shocking. The stories about Cañada Real are typically tainted by, by that of drugs and of crime. But actually when you're driving through here yourself, it's very clear that there are much bigger problems at play here. I don't think anybody's denying the fact that there are drugs in, in Kenya de Real, nor would you deny that there are drugs in any neighborhood of any city around the world. But actually walking through here right now, it is absolutely shocking to see the state that some people have been left, left living in. Whilst the state has started demolishing homes here in Sector 6 as per the Pact of 2017, evidence of demolished buildings is dotted along the whole of Kenya de Real. Huda told me that in 2007, when those from the neighboring settlement Las Barranquillas moved in, the government would start demolishing properties as a way to fight its war on drugs, as it was once reported that the so-called drug supermarket here in Cañada Real once saw up to 10,000 customers a day. These demolitions were branded illegal in 2013, but they didn't stop entirely. Now, the government must give prior notice and a reason before knocking down a building here. Residents told me that the plots of land left fenced and secured feels like a constant threat of what the government could do, should they so choose. The action taken by the government certainly seemed hostile, especially when those in their sights are mostly innocent residents now struggling with the lack of power. Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo está? <risa> Voy a conseguir una, de momento. Luego, si conseguimos más, os aviso. 
Vale, de momento una. Vale. Spending even just a small amount of time with Huda and following her life, it became very clear as to how important she is for her surrounding neighborhood. Alongside working in the city and bringing up two daughters here in Kenyatta, she works tirelessly to improve the lives of those in the community around her. Son mucha gente, eh, muchas necesidades, y bueno, hay que intentar uh, ayudar a todo el mundo. Waiting for her when she got back home were two people donating shoes to her from a store that had recently closed down in Madrid. Huda tells me that she plans to hand them out to people in the neighborhood that need them most. I was told that all residents want is their normal life back, for things to return to how it was before 2007. However, the power supply to Cañada Real has always been unregulated and therefore technically illegal. But residents say they have no choice as they have repeatedly been refused the right to enter contracts. Despite many protests for the right to pay for their electricity like any other Madrid citizen, the right has never been granted. Their pleas have always fallen on deaf ears. The power was cut in October 2020, just months into the pandemic. And only three months later, Spain was hit by a historic snowfall that killed five. Even then, power was never restored to Cañada Real. Instead, they were given butane heaters that reportedly caused carbon monoxide poisoning and were offered shelter in a nearby disused factory, but only 15 beds were offered to over 4,000 people. When we found out that la going to be the historic in Spain, nos was a lot of fear because, first of all, Cañada Real is isolated. Hemos estado sin agua durante tres días porque se congelaron las tuberías. Las bombonas eh, de gas para cocinar se quedaron heladas. No podíamos cocinar. Eh, sentías que estás eh, metida eh, en un congelador y no había manera de poder... Perdón. No había manera de poder calentar a tus hijos o a las personas mayores que tengas, a bebés. Y entonces eh, empezaron, empezaron las decaídas de enfermedades. Eh, muchos bebés que se han ingresado por síntomas de congelación. Cañada Real eh, ha sobrevivido por, por la resistencia de sus vecinos. Pero ahora resulta pues, que nos quieren quitar de alguna manera. Being with Huda showed me just how important this fight really is. These are regular Madrid citizens living normal lives. The fight they're currently going through might be about electricity, but this really seemed like a battle for recognition. The stigma around Cañada hangs over the settlement like a dark cloud. I wanted to know how the stigmas worked and how people really saw Cañada Real. So I set up a meeting with someone from a local NGO called Barrow, a charity working within Sector 6 offering education and cultural mediation to residents. We attempted to make it on foot, but we were stopped by police as we entered the sector. There, indeed. I can see it though. We've just tried to get into Sector 6, but just as we've arrived on the border between Sector 5 and 6, we were actually stopped by police, who told us it would be too dangerous for us to actually walk in by ourselves. They told us that we would have to get the person who we're meeting to come and escort us into Sector 6. Um, but as we messaged the person that we were trying to meet, they kind of were a bit shocked as to what happened to us and were actually a bit confused as to why we were in that situation. Um, if anything, I think they believed that the police were almost feeding the stigma about Sector 6 and that we would have actually been fine to walk in anyway. We've rescheduled for tomorrow and we're going to head in by car instead. But returning back to Sector 5, I actually noticed something about the bridge that I'm currently stood on. It's the pathway that connects Sector 5, which is behind me, with Sector 6, which is just in front of me. Now, numerous cars are passing beneath me right now. They're passing through a situation that the UN has branded as a human rights violation. It almost seems as though the situation's hidden in plain sight. We rescheduled our interview and traveled in by car instead. We arrived without issue. Seguimos estigmatizando a la cañada, seguimos o sea, como mirando para otro lado, diciendo que pues, 
pues están sin luz y que pues como no pagan como no pagan facturas de la luz que se busquen que se busquen la vida eh, la gente que no conoce Cañada no es consciente de la realidad de Cañada Cañada son 16 kilómetros compuestos de seis sectores si no se entiende toda esa diversidad al final te quedas con lo que eh, se vende muchas veces desde los, desde los medios y desde las televisiones, que es el tema de la venta de droga. La venta de, de droga, como, tal y como se conoce aquí, es un kilómetro. Sí. Es un kilómetro. Eh, entonces, eh, juzgar, a, vuelvo a repetir, pero juzgar a todo un barrio por las actividades ilícitas que hagan unos pocos, lo mínimo que es, es, es injusto. Porque la droga se vende en todos los barrios de Madrid, en todos los barrios de Barcelona, en todos los barrios de Londres o en todos los barrios de Nueva York. O sea, el tema de la droga es una lacra mundial. Nosotras siempre decimos que, que los niños y niñas de, de Cañada ya, o sea, son para nosotros son héroes y heroínas porque con todas las dificultades que están teniendo, el ir al colegio con normalidad, seguir sus clases, hacer las tareas, estudiar para los exámenes, en estas condiciones creemos que claramente se merecen la, la categoría de, de héroes y heroínas. It's clear that the media's sole focus on Cañada's drug problems is what's building the negative stigma around the settlement, only at the expense of the innocent children living here who make up nearly a quarter of the neighborhood's population. I wanted to know more about how a power cut could have lasted for so long, leaving so many people suffering. Naturgy, the electricity company responsible for supplying power to Kenyatta, sent me a statement claiming that they've always attempted to work with those in the neighborhood to try and find solutions to problems. They stated that they're in solidarity with the residents here, but so much power being drawn illegally from the grid is what tripped the network in the first place. The commissioner of Kenyatta Real, appointed by the government of Madrid to oversee the changes made after the 2017 pact was signed, backed up Niturgi's claim, but went one step further. The exact quote that he uses is that the brutal demand for electric power related to the crops of prohibited substances in sectors five and six is what caused the power to go out. Now it's when he starts talking about contracts where things start to get a little bit interesting. So he says that the land on which sector six is built upon is actually ecologically protected. As a result, no one in sector six can be granted the right of habitability on that land. Now he says that without that right, people of Sector 6 are unable to enter contracts with Naturgy. He concluded the statement by referring back to the 2017 Pact of Cañada Real, saying that the medium to long term solution is to dismantle the whole area and to rehome everybody in Sector 6. Now despite the situation as being branded as a human rights violation by the UN and heavily condemned by Amnesty International, there seems to be very little short term solution at play, even if the long term solution is to dismantle the whole of Sector 6. Because of that, it seems that thousands of people are going to continue without electricity for the foreseeable future. Naturgy did concede that three properties in Sector 6 held contracts, which contradicts the Commissioner's statement that no one is able to unprotected land. Politically, it felt like those in Kenyatta had very little representation, and so I decided to travel to the headquarters of the opposition party in Madrid's assembly and meet with Alejandro Jacinto, who is a human rights lawyer and politician from the left-wing socialist party Podemos. She's very critical of the current government's actions regarding Cañada. Yo creo que es una decisión política de la Comunidad de Madrid en connivencia o en colaboración con Naturgy, que es la, la empresa eléctrica para, para obligar a la población a que abandonen sus hogares y ahorrarse unos cuantos realojos. Yo creo que esto es un plan por el cual la Comunidad de Madrid quiere que el sector 6 desaparezca, parte del 5 también, Y, y quieren ahorrarse el coste que supone tener que realojar a la población y por eso están utilizando estos métodos de extorsión que es bueno pues cortar eh, la luz para que sea invivible para que Cañada Real no se pueda vivir y la gente pues ante morirse de frío se tenga que ver en la obligación de irse de allí muchos políticos de la Comunidad de Madrid dicen bueno es que quieren tener luz y no pagarla no no los vecinos de Cañada Real quieren pagarla y, y, y pueden hacerlo eh, y la realidad es que la Comunidad de Madrid regularizó por ejemplo el suministro de agua en, en diferentes sectores de Cañada Real hace, hace un par de años, con lo cual sí que se puede, se puede hacer, lo que pasa es que tienes que tener voluntad política de que eh, la gente pueda vivir ahí, si, si tu objetivo es que la gente se vaya, pues, pues claro, pues intentas poner todas las excusas posibles.
It was interesting to hear that the government had regularised the water supply only years before the power outage, which then poses the question as to why this can't happen with electricity in Sector 6. In 2020, children in Kenyatta wrote a series of letters to the UN, imploring them to fight for light to return to their neighbourhood. I'd heard that Alejandra had read some to President Ayuso, and so I asked about the response that she got. Yo en el en el primer pleno de septiembre, antes de que se cumpliera el, el aniversario de, de esta triste fecha de 2 de octubre, un año sin luz, pues quise leérsela a la presidenta para interpelarla y para, para decirle, eh, tienes que devolver la luz, los niños te lo están pidiendo. Y ella me contestó que ella no gestionaba sentimientos ni emociones. This is our president. <laughs> It was evident, speaking with Alejandra, that people in Kenyatta get very little sympathy from those in charge. However, whilst politically they're in a difficult position, their legal state is even trickier. I met with Javier Rubio, a housing lawyer from a firm called Kais, who's provided legal aid to those in Kenyatta for many years. Because the power supply Kenyatta has received for over 40 years is largely unregulated, he says the legal action he can take becomes very complicated. He also seems to think there's a bigger motive here to get residents out of the area than just the war on drugs. La ciudad de Madrid crece. Alrededor de Cañada Real, eh, colindante con Cañada Real, eh, existen hasta cinco grandes desarrollos urbanísticos para la próxima década de más de 100.000 viviendas. Eso puede ser fácilmente 400.000 habitantes nuevos. Y el corte de suministro coincide con la reactivación de estos planes urbanísticos de crecimiento de la ciudad. Por lo tanto, eh, este barrio no era problemático mientras no estaba vecino de esos desarrollos. Ahora que esos desarrollos se reactivan, eh, pues resultan unos vecinos incómodos. Hay que desalojarlos rápido y el corte de suministro facilita un desalojo forzoso y colectivo sin apenas eh, eh, retrasos para los proyectos urbanísticos. No puedo prever el futuro eh, eh, y lo que pienso es que estamos en un momento crítico de esta lucha vecinal en el que no sabemos hacia dónde va a ir, hacia dónde se va a decantar la suerte. The conversation I had just now with Javier was really interesting. One of the biggest points that I had to take away from what he had to say was what he was saying about the housing development plans in the area around Cañada Real. If it is the case, and this simply coincides with the electricity problems of sectors five and six, then to me it's either a huge coincidence or it's very damning if they are linked. Hearing that the government could be creating such a hostile environment as a way to clear the area for new apartment blocks seemed obscene. But that's what the evidence seemed to suggest. The drugs in the area certainly aren't fictional, but it definitely seems as though they're being used as an excuse. What that leaves, though, are thousands of innocent people who don't want to leave their community behind, stuck living in awful conditions. On the final day of our trip, we decided to visit Huda one last time. She'd arranged for us to meet with the neighbours who lived across the street. We spoke briefly with a young man who's a father to a one-year-old girl. He says he's struggling to keep her safe and healthy, living with no electricity. Pues es una experiencia mala porque por las noches más que nada, con la niña, tengo que estar todo el rato echando madera. Yo no duermo. Entonces yo no puedo dormir para echar leña para que ella esté caliente, porque se puede poner mala. ¿Cómo sientes que es siendo padre y no tener electricidad para tu hija? Es una cosa que no te lo podría explicar. Es una cosa que no te lo puedo explicar. Tienes, tienes que vivirlo. Muy malo. Muy malo. Walking into this section of Cañada Real, it's clear that the lives are affected greatly by the lack of electricity. They showed me their new way of washing clothes, with a chair, a slab of concrete and cold water. They told me that their youngest children hadn't gone to school that day because their clothes hadn't dried. I was then introduced to Ramon an 84-year-old who'd lived in Kenyatta for over 25 years. Huda asked him what he thought the reason for the power outage was. What 
que no, no me diga nada. De eso no lo sé. Eso no es verdad. Just as we started to speak with Ramon, his wife came over and invited us into her home so she could show us what they have to put up with on a daily basis. Y ya está. Eh, eh, salud, eh, ¿quién crees que es culpable de todo lo que está pasando en Canadá? Porque mira, se echan las culpas unas a los otros. El gobierno, la, la que manda, la que la lleva la Comunidad de Madrid, de Madrid la Comunidad sí. de Madrid. Es que no se sabe, no se sabe quién es la culpa. ¿La tienen la culpa todo o no todo se lava la mano? Eso. Sí. Donde quiera que sea para que nos ayuden. Que nos ayuden, por favor. O sea, quien sea, pero que nos ayude, que nos echen una mano, porque esto no se puede vivir. No se puede vivir. Salud and her family currently live just outside the area planned for rehousing, but residents know it's a fate that's slowly moving towards them. While some say they're happy to leave, the majority of those I spoke with say they want to stay within the community that they built. Salud is one of them and says that she hates the idea of moving away from her neighbours. ¿De qué, ¿De qué me mantengo yo en un piso? Dime, por muy a gusto que esté, ni mucha limpieza que tenga. Mucha comunidad que hay en un piso. ¿Y qué hago yo en un piso? Dime usted a mí qué hago yo en un piso. ¿Y tú estás feliz viviendo aquí, Salud? Yo prefiero vivir aquí. Porque aquí hay un trocito de pan, no me, no me hace falta. Hay que salvarlo, pero no me hace falta. Y yo sé que voy a meterme en un piso y de aquí me, tiene, vamos, me tengo que quitar de muchas cosas. Ya. Uno oh, pagó el piso. Y al final, cuando me lo pagué el piso, estoy un año, estoy dos y me echan a la calle. Sí. Por la chama la calle, prefiero estar aquí. Vale. Es la que es así, la realidad es así. Pero el, el gobierno dice que la solución son los realojos. ¿Para ti cuál es la solución? Si no, no hay otra. otra. Si no, si no hay, hay otra. otra. Son los que mandan, son los que tienen el poder. Eh. Que lo hagan de qué manera sea mejor. Y ya está. Vale. Que se lo piensen, ¿Cómo? que piensen la vida que traemos nosotros aquí, la vida que traemos lo tranquilo que sea y ya está. Claro. Conforme está la luz que está por los cielos de Cristo, sí, sí, al final sí. voy a quedarme sin luz. Al final, sí, al final vas a estar igual. Voy a estar igual. Pues yo no pago. We were taken across into a different building, past the small generator that's been powering the whole compound. Salud told me that her husband relies on a mask to sleep at night due to a breathing condition. But without power, he's not able to wear it as often as he should, resulting in his health deteriorating rapidly. El médico le aconseja estar 24 horas conectado. Después del corte de luz, solo está dos horas. O sea que su salud cada vez está peor. Está mucho peor, 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 peor. Speaking with Salud and her family, it's clear that the sense of belonging and community is so strong here. Something they know they wouldn't get in an apartment in a different part of the country. They're proud Madrid citizens who feel abandoned and forgotten. I think that when you're talking about Cañada Real, and especially Sector 6, it's quite easy to get lost in the political world of it all, you know, the political argument. But actually right at the heart of all this are, you know, people. A lot of the journalistic reports and government reports that I read before actually coming out here were so heavily focused on the drug crime and you know, all that sort of stuff that actually it completely ignores what we've seen today. You know, it's, it's quite shocking to think that this is happening right in one of the richest countries in Europe. You could say that the residents of Cañada Real, who've lived in this community for decades, are just collateral damage in Madrid's war on drugs. But it seems more than that, almost as though the narrative of drugs is being used as an excuse to force 4,000 people from their homes. It's a difficult situation that sees Madrid expanding rapidly and towards Cañada Real. It's clear Salud and Huda's neighborhood is in the way. As Sector 6 is slowly dismantled and no contracts are handed out, it seems as though thousands of innocent Madrid citizens will have to continue enduring life in this humanitarian catastrophe.